Mark chapter 16. If you have a Bible, today we're going to finish the gospel of, of Mark. And really, I believe we just have about seven verses to close this out. But let me pray for us before we get started. Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for this uh, time of the year when our hearts and minds focus on uh, the, the sending of a Savior, the, the receiving of a Savior into the world, into our lives. And just ask, Lord, that you would speak to us today as we close out the Gospel of Mark, that your voice would be heard and that we would be responsive to what you have to say to each of us individually and as a church. We, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We ended with verse 14, but I'd like to read that verse again. Later, it says, he appeared to the eleven, speaking of Jesus after his resurrection, as they sat at the table. And it's interesting what it says here. He, he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Now, now the word rebuke, it's an interesting word in the Greek. It means to reprimand, to chastise, to disapprove of, to admonish, or to sternly scold. So here's Jesus. Obviously, Judas is not in the picture. The 11 are there. And he's rebuking the disciples. Not for their denial, which you would think he would, like, you guys denied me? Not, not for the fact that they all ran and hid as he was arrested in the garden. Not for them being afraid and fearful or for not showing up at the cross where he was crucified. It seems the thing he rebukes them for is for their unbelief. And, and I would submit to you that's because belief is the main issue in life when it comes to Christ. Believing in him, trusting in him. Now, he, he doesn't camp on this rebuke. He doesn't overdo it, so to speak. He, he quickly moves on. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He rebuked them for their unbelief. And then he said, okay, we, we have business to do. Now, Peter, later on in, in his epistle in 1 Peter 1.8, would, would, would say, whom having not seen... He remembered being rebuked for, for, for not seeing. Whom having not seen you love, though, though now you do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. Jesus rebukes him for unbelief, and then he calls them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, now, I want you to understand, you probably know this already, that the central command Jesus gives to his disciples, the emphasis is not on the word go. A lot of times you'll hear that's preached or taught, and it's, 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 the emphasis is on the word go. In Matthew's gospel and here in Mark, the primary focus is preach the gospel to every creature. And, and the flow really is, is kind of like this. As you go, or as you're going into all the world, the going is taken for granted. That you're going to be going, you're going to be living, you're going to be traveling, you're going to be uh, throughout the world. That, that's part of it. But the emphasis is, is not on foreign missions or, 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 or that kind of idea, although that's part of it. But it's as you and I, as we go into our world, tell the good news of Jesus Christ. The, the central theme, the central focus is the gospel, the good news. And the good news, well, it's the death of Jesus Christ or the cross. It's the resurrection or the empty tomb. In the death of Christ and in the resurrection of Christ, you have the solution to the problem we all share together. 
And that's the weakness of our flesh or the sinfulness of our hearts, the evil that we participate in, the, the incomplete sense of life that something's missing. It's, it's solved by the person of Jesus Christ who died on a cross for our sins and rose from the dead. On the cross... Though not mentioned in Mark, when Jesus breathed his last breath, he spoke a powerful word. In English, it's three words. It is finished. In the Greek, it's just one word, to telestai. It's an interesting word. It's a verb form, and it means to bring something to an end to complete it, to accomplish it. Just like we're bringing to an end the study of the gospel of Mark, we, we're finishing it. It's done. It's like a word that you would use if you finally graduated from college to tell us die. Ah, it's over. It's a word that you would use if you pay off your house or your credit cards to tell us die. It, it, it's done. Dave Ramsey pats you on the back. <laughs> it's a word you would use if you crossed the finish line after running a marathon. You know, to tell us die. It's done. Or even more importantly, a milestone in life. Some of you have experienced this. When you buy your last box of diapers <laughs> and you potty trained your last child. I mean, that's an amazing to tell us, die. <laughs> the, the tense of the verb, the word to tell us, die, is, is in the perfect tense in Greek. And, and it speaks of an action. It speaks of something that has been completed in the past with results that continue on into the future. It, it's kind of like this. It happened, but it's still in effect Today, it's finished. It's finished in the past, but, but it's still finished in the present, and it will continue to be finished all the way into the future. And Jesus did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. Successfully completed the work that he came to do. And all kinds of things, when Jesus breathed to laugh on that cross, were, were finished. The hatred and the malice of his enemies, all that they could do to Jesus was finally over. They can't do anything else more to Jesus. His suffering, which was ordained by God, is finally Done. It's over. In, in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, we have this verse. Him being delivered by the determined purpose. It was God's doing. And foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. Foreordained by the Father, now it, it's, it's over. All the Old Testament types and Prophecies are completely fulfilled in Christ. Those things that spoke of him, his, his denial and the 30 pieces of silver mentioned in the Old Testament. His hands and feet would be pierced, mentioned there by prophets. His garments divided, his side pierced. All, all these things that had been spoken of about him. And, and the ceremonial law is now Finish. Romans chapter 10, verse 4 speaks of this when it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone, and there's that word again, who believes. Who believes. That's a, that's a central focus of the gospel, to, to believe, to trust. The, the price for sin now paid in full. John chapter 1, verse 29 speaks of that. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's completed. As we, as we come to the end of the, the, the gospel of Mark and Jesus is telling them to go into all the world and preach the gospel because everything that he came to do for the salvation of mankind now is done. 
The physical suffering is over. And Jesus now enters into the joy that's set before him. His earthly mission and life is, is ended, and the work of redemption, our salvation, is now complete for you, for me, for the entire lost planet paid in full. Jesus paid for your sin. He, he paid for my sin. And there on the cross, he, he died for it, and then he rose from the dead to, to never now ever leave us or forsake us ever again. What keeps you, what keeps me? I mean, do you ever think, what, what are those things in your life that keep you from a deeper, more satisfying, consistent relationship with the Lord? What are those things? Is it anger? Are you one of those road ragers? Or do you just snap sometimes? Is it lust? Is it unbelief? Is it, is it alcohol abuse? Is it the uncontrolled temper? Is it cheating? Everyone has things in their life that they wrestle with and have difficulties with. Is it stealing? Is it adultery? Is it a past sin that, that haunts you like abortion or pride or greed, sexual sin, bitterness? See, it doesn't matter how guilty you are. Everyone's guilty. There's none righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. All my sin, your sin, can, can be stamped with one word over it to tell us die. It's finished. Paid in full. Gossip to tell us die. Drunkenness, to tell us die. Fornication, stealing, lying, disobedience, pride, murder, sexual sin, the blood of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection has opened the door for your forgiveness. The big issue that Jesus rebuked his disciples about was belief. Do I believe that? That he died on the cross for my sin and that he rose from the dead proving that the sacrifice was accepted by the Father. Jesus rebuked his disciples for unbelief. And then he says, now, now you've seen me. Now you believe. Now let's get to work, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's not so much where we go, but what we're to do when we get there. Across the ocean, across the street, across the world, or around the neighborhood. Our, our message. I think it's clearly given to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel, isn't it? Jesus died for our sins. He rose from the dead. And now salvation comes through belief. He, he goes on in verse 16. These are the words of Jesus. First, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, that good news, the death and burial and resurrection. And he who believes, there's that word again, and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. The outward public expression of salvation, of belief, of faith is, is baptism. Not that baptism saves you. The New Testament believers and writers assume under normal circumstances that each believer will be baptized. It's not that you don't go to heaven. It's just the normal thing you do after you come to Christ. It's that public expression of, of I've died to my old life and I've risen to a new life in Jesus Christ. And, and I would submit to you, if you've never been baptized, what's up with that? Why would you not get baptized? It's a public way of expressing your faith. 
There, there's something, I'll, I'll never forget, I, I, I spoke in a church in, in Baltimore uh, a year or so ago, and, and one of the guys who started that church, there was on staff here. And he asked me to come and speak, and, and so I did. And he, he, had a, he had some pictures that I was unaware of that he had. He had one of me doing his wedding. I, I didn't remember that I did his wedding. <laughs> and he said, I've got a picture of you baptizing me. And we were out here in the Gulf of Mexico, and, 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 and I was unaware of this story. He, uh, he said, yeah, when Pastor John, who was about to introduce me, baptized me, he said, he said the weirdest thing. He said, when you come up out of the water, you're going to see an angel. And he said, I kind of thought, this guy's losing it. But I could see the blue angels coming down the beach. <laughs> so I was kind of waiting, like, okay. And he came up, he goes, sure enough, that, that, there was an angel. I'm not going to say you'll see an angel when you're baptized. But you should get baptized. It's a great experience. But baptize, baptizing or being baptized is, is not a necessity or a requirement for salvation. In fact, the second part of this verse says, he who does not believe will be condemned, not he who is not or she who is not baptized. It's belief that removes the reality of sin, not baptism. And then we have this verse, verse 17 and 18. And I don't think you find this in any of the other gospels. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. Cast out demons. Speak with new tongues. And we see that throughout the book of Acts, both of these but this one, they'll, they'll take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, we see that, and they will recover. As they're sharing the gospel, as they're proclaiming the good news, signs accompanying the ministry, casting out demons, speaking in tongues, those two are prominent throughout the Scripture, even in today's world. Well, we saw it in Acts in the day of Pentecost and throughout the book of Acts, tongues, the casting out of demons. And in verse 18, most of the commentators and scholars I would read on this verse seems to be a, a, a clause or a verse that scholars have read in this fashion. If they be compelled to pick up snakes, if they be compelled to drink deadly poison, it, it seems to be couched in the understanding of persecution, not some voluntary thing. Hey, I'm a Christian. I'm going to pick up this snake. You know, my, my, my son, Ryan, he's, he's quite a prankster, and he he pranks everybody on staff here at the church. And One time he had a fake rubber snake in the hallway over by the kitchen where all the staff will eat lunch at times, and he had it on a, on a fishing line. And a couple of the ladies on staff are coming through the doorway, and he's dragging that snake through, and they're screaming and yelling. And I thought, well, what about Mark chapter 16? And, and he, he does that to his kids all the time. He scares them with snakes and stuff. And, and one time his young daughter, unaware, was in the backyard, and there was a real snake back there, and she thought her dad was pranking her. And she grabbed it. Look, Dad, a snake. He goes, throw that snake down. <laughs> snakes, can, snakes are scary. So I know you've heard maybe of these, these, these religious groups up in the... Uh, well, they're up in areas where people are a little more country. Because <laughs> I know if I say where it is, someone's going, I'm from there. Uh, they pick up snakes and throw them across the church and stuff. And I don't think this verse encourages that. 
But I think there are times when people perhaps have been persecuted and forced to do things. And yet there are very valid things that follow those who believe. You never see this practice of picking up snakes or, or drinking poison ever encouraged or practiced in the, in the new early church. You know, like next Wednesday, we're having a special service. Bring your strychnine and arsenic. A few copperheads if you have them. Uh, we're going to have a special service. No, work up your faith. Uh, probably be slimly attended, but... We, we know that Paul, when he was being taken to trial before Caesar, was shipwrecked off the island of Malta, and he was bitten by a poisonous snake as he was helping gather firewood for a fire, and, and there was a snake that all the locals on the island recognized as a poisonous snake, and they knew what happened to people when they were bit by a snake like that. And they said to Paul, you must be a very wicked man. You, you survived the storm and the shipwreck, but now you've been bitten by this snake. But the scripture says he just shook it off. And there was a great revival on that island because of the apostle Paul. They, they would pray for the sick. They, they did healing and, and God would, would grant recovery and wholeness to people. And, and I would add this to this passage of scripture that it says, he, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. It never encourages believers to follow signs, but that signs follow believers. And, and I'm always uncomfortable when you see people running to things where signs are supposed to occur because we're not supposed to follow signs. Signs are supposed to follow us. Those who go about sharing the good news, the gospel, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, verse 19, he was received up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Mark closes his gospel with Christ in heaven, mission complete, assuming his position, his place of honor and glory, received into heaven, sitting at the, at the right hand of God. In the book of Acts on one of the earliest martyrs to the faith, Stephen was preaching, if you remember the story, to, to the religious leaders after Jesus had risen from the dead, after they were going and preaching the gospel. And the religious leaders were, were very impacted by Stephen's message. L listen to what it said. I'll just read it to you from the book of Acts chapter 7. These are the words of Stephen to those unbelieving Jewish leaders who had Christ put to death. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute and kill those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom now you have become the betrayers and murderers? who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not even kept it. And when they heard these things, they heard what Stephen was saying. They were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. And here's what he saw. The glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Just as it says in Mark, he, he, he went back to the Father, standing at the right hand of the Father. And they said, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city. They stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul was there who would become the apostle Paul one day. 
They stoned Stephen as he was calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sign, with this sin. And when he had said this, he died or he fell asleep. The Lord appearing after his resurrection, after his ascension in heaven, being seen by Stephen, still, still working with those who follow, who share the gospel, still healing those who are lost, still today restoring marriages to tell us, die, it, it is finished. Today, hearts, he touches with the gospel. He, he, he gives new life. When, when Jesus died for your sins and, and for my sins, once again, he said, it is finished. He, he, he rose from the dead. And he said to his followers, believe, trust. No, no, know the reality of my resurrection and what I did for you on the cross. And, and as you were going through your life, as you're going into your world, preach this news, this, this great news. I think we all know what it's like to have unfinished things in our life. That, that unfinished half-read book that's in your bedroom or in your bookcase. The diet that didn't get finished. You say, John, don't talk about that during Christmas time. <laughs> well, everyone's about to talk about it in a couple of weeks. The, maybe the degree that you never quite finished at school or, or the job you quit in anger and, and wish you hadn't of or, 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 or the marriage you messed up or the bills that didn't get paid or the promises that didn't get kept. I, I think we all know what it's like to, to have things in life that we don't finish. Well, Jesus finished it, his work, completely on the cross. He rose from the dead. He offers new life. And he says to those who truly have trusted, who have believed in him, now, now I want you to go. I want you to go. And I, 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 as you're going, preach the gospel, this gospel of new life. And, and of course, the question is, what would, what would keep someone like you or me or those that we know from receiving what he has to offer? Do you believe? Do you trust in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That, that's the question. The, the work has been done. It's been completely finished. And as we finish up here in the Gospel of Mark, just these, these very short seven verses, we have this amazing finality to Mark's Gospel. As he says to the disciples, and I think he says to you and I, first of all, after being rebuked for their unbelief, He says, now I want you to go. Now that you see me, now that you've trusted me, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every creature, every person. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned, and these signs will follow. And then after that, the Lord went to his reward. See, maybe you're here today, and I would ask you the question, uh, what would keep you from believing? What would it be? What is it that, that, that you say, well, I've got to finish this, or I've got to do that, or I've got to whatever it might, or I just can't. If Jesus were here in the flesh, he would rebuke you for your unbelief. He certainly did his disciples. And then once you do believe... He places on your life and my life the responsibility to share the gospel. That's our calling. That, that's our biggest, most important task that we have in life. 
all the other tasks that you have, whatever your, your job or, or, or whatever, whatever it is that you put your energy to and your, your heart in every single day, the biggest task that you and I have been left with as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ is to take the gospel, is it not? I mean, when I, when I get to heaven, it's not going to be Jesus. Well, how well did you take care of your car? Well, pretty good. Kept it running. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You know, I don't think so. What did you do with, with, with the gospel that I gave to you, that saved you, that, that cleansed you, that brought you into my family? Did you share it? Did you know it? Did you believe it? It's interesting to me that, you know, I would have expected that if Jesus showed up there with the 11, all of them had denied, all of them had fled, all of them had hidden, all of them were scared, that Jesus would have said a few things about that. You guys are cowards. After all you've seen, he doesn't mention it. The only thing he rebukes them for is their unbelief. Why didn't you believe in, in my resurrection, I told you about it. And, you, and others saw me and told you about it. And then he just says, now, now let's, let's get on with the business of what it means to follow me and know me and trust me and believe in me. Take the gospel. See, what would keep you, if you're here and don't know Christ, from receiving what he offers to you? Do, do you believe? Do you trust the cross and the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ? That, that's the gospel, that he died on the cross for your sins. He paid the price. There's nothing more he can do. It is finished. Well, I would believe in Jesus if he did this. No, it's finished. Well, I believe in Jesus if he would just do this, you know, cause this to happen and miraculous thing to occur. No, he's already done it. He, he died on the cross for your sin. The, the Son of God died on the cross for your sin, and he rose from the dead. That's the gospel. What more do you want him to do? Paid the price completely. Said, said, said the work is finished. And I would submit to you there is nothing more that he can do for your salvation or mine. The only thing left to do is for you and I to believe and to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen. That's the only thing left for us to do. <laughs> and that's what he's called us to do.